said, this man has never studied in school. How did he learn so much? Jesus answered, the things I teach are not my own, but they come from him who sent me. If people choose to do what God wants, they'll know that my teaching comes from God and not from me. Those who teach their own ideas are trying to get honor for themselves. But those who try to bring honor to the one who sent them speak the truth, and there is nothing false in them. Moses gave you the law, but none of you obeys that law. Why are you trying to kill me? Now, if you are a respected person, highly educated, this would have really got to you that he spoke with such authority. They were puzzled. And they wanted to know, what is your authority? How could you speak the way you did? They were not used to having someone like this around them. And it made them feel uncomfortable. You know, Jesus didn't use notes. I use notes because my mind is not so fast or clever. But he didn't use quotes from different people. He didn't refer to the authority of another rabbi. He just spoke God's word. But make no mistake, they knew and understood that Jesus was well educated. And they knew what authority was. And they knew what it sounded like when it came from them. And Jesus' reply was very simple. My authority is this. I speak the words of God. My teaching is not mine. It is he who sent me. So a preacher's authority comes only when he speaks the word of God. Outside of that, he has no authority whatsoever. A preacher is commanded to speak the words of God. That's his job. That's his authority, is to proclaim the word of God. Just as Jesus proclaimed the words that his father gave him. Now there's much confusion about this authority and where it comes from. Many people are confused. What constitutes authority? How is it to be used? And, you know, I think back to my, well, teenage years. I knew when I was in trouble with my mum. You know, mothers are very caring, very nurturing. But you know when you're in trouble, when the voice goes up and she calls you by name in a certain way, in a certain tone, you know you're in trouble. And you're told, get yourself over here. You know you better respond or it's only going to be worse for you. That's the authority of your mother. Speaking, You recognize it, you see it for what it is. And there is no mistake and there is no way that I was going to say, not doing what you tell, Mum, I'm, I'm going to do my own thing, you go away. Wouldn't happen. I'd be the worst for wear afterwards. It just didn't happen. You recognize that authority. But today we're so confused about what constitutes authority and how is it to be used? And one commentator, an old commentator, uh, he gave some, some perspectives on how authority is misrepresented. Now, it's my outline, but it's his thoughts. And the first one that he uses is this. Oops, too far. Is apostolic power. There are people who claim to have the same power that Jesus had. That they claim that they're able to do the same things as the apostles because they believe that it had been passed down to them through apostolic succession. These same people claim to be anointed with personal supernatural powers. They claim to have authority over Satan, over demons, over diseases and illnesses. And they claim they can get God to intervene and heal those who need it if they want. These people are commanding when they have no such authority to do so. Very clearly the Bible doesn't teach that. 
They have no jurisdiction to operate and do things that only God can do. They have given themselves an authority that they have no right to. It's over and above the biblical authority that God gives man to exercise. Apostolic succession is not something that's passed on. It finished with the last apostle. In Matthew 10, 1, Jesus said, he called the 12 followers together and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and sickness. Now, I don't know whether I put these up or not. No, I didn't. The same thing in Mark 3, 14 and 15. Jesus called 12 and called them apostles. He wanted them to be with him. He wanted to send them out to preach and to have the authority to force demons out of people. Once again in scripture, in Luke 9, 1, Jesus called the 12 apostles together and gave them power and authority over all demons and the ability to heal sicknesses. What we have in scripture is Jesus called 12 men together and gave them this power to do it. Only these men. It was a specific task that Christ and the apostles were given to do. It wasn't something that every Christian is called to do. And it's confirmed again in Acts 19 verses 11 to 16. God used Paul to do some very special miracles. Some people took handkerchiefs and clothes that Paul had used and put them on the sick. When they did this, the sick were healed and evil spirits left them. But some people also were traveling around and making evil spirits go out of people. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus to force the evil spirits out. They would say, by the same Jesus that Paul talks about, I order you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time an evil spirit said to them, I know Jesus, I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them because he was so much stronger than all of them, they ran away from the house naked and hurt. Apostolic succession finished with the apostle Paul. It was never granted to anyone else. The only authority we have since the days of the apostles is the word of God. It starts with Genesis, it ends with Revelation. That is the only authority that we need and we have today. Another misconception is absolute power. There are those who claim to have the power and authority to speak for God today. And they believe that authority has been given to the church to exercise absolute power in the name of Christ concerning spiritual matters. It is claiming that the church has the sole power and the right to determine the issues of faith and practice. They claim they have the confidence in the Bible. They understand it as the word of God, but they claim their authority goes beyond the Bible. It includes, includes traditions and creeds and dogmas to interpret and understand what the Bible has to say. The basis for this absolute power comes from apostolic succession, meaning every pope is a successor to the office of apostle and has equal rank with the apostle Peter. The significance of this authority is they believe that when the pope speaks ex cathedra, out of his chair, out of his throne, he has papal infallibility and is revealing new truths. This is where such doctrines are promoted, endorsed, like purgatory, where people, when they die, going to a waiting place where they will suffer for a little while to do enough good things to get to heaven. And so it go, goes on. These and other things are clearly promoted with absolute authority and power given to the church alone to implement these things. The belief is that the Bible can be overruled by the church, that the word of God is under the church, that the word of God is judged by the church. Now, it's interesting when I look at that, I find no such authority for these things in the Bible. We believe the Bible is the sole authority. 
We believe that the sole standard for our faith and practice is the word of God, nothing more, nothing less. You see, I don't stand on what one person tells me. I stand on what the Bible says, what God has to say. That is my authority. And true Christianity believes that the church is under the authority of the word of God. There is no other authority that's acceptable. God is the final authority. He's revealed his will through the prophets and apostles who wrote the Bible and now declares, this is my word, this is what you are to preach. There is another power that's misconcepted or misinterpreted as being a power and it's what I call academic power. It's appealed to logic and reason being the authority. History has shown us through the Renaissance and Enlightenment periods where people expressed wonderful ideas in figuring out things in the material world. Yet this Enlightenment and Renaissance period made no contributions into solving the spiritual issues relating to God. And the reason for that is God is not known through reason and logic. Sure, we can know that God exists, but that doesn't mean we can know him. Reason cannot know God because it's limited. It's limited to ideas. It's limited to concepts. It doesn't deal with relationships. My reason cannot get me to God. I can know there is a God, but I cannot know him through reason. As 1 Corinthians 2, 11 to 14 says, who knows the thoughts that another person has? Only a person's spirit that lives within him knows his thoughts. It is the same with God. No one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we did not receive the spirit of the world, but we received the spirit that is from God so that we can know all that God has given us. And we speak about these things, not with words taught by human wisdom, but with words taught to us by the Spirit. So we can explain spiritual truths to spiritual people. A person who does not have that Spirit does not accept the truths that come from the Spirit of God. That person thinks they're foolish, cannot understand them because they can only be judged by, to be true by the Spirit of God. Now there are many people today who believe they have authority because of their wisdom and their common sense. That they've gained insights into the human mind and life. And they believe that through knowledge and education, we have great power to change people's lives. When I look at our modern society today, it's not going very well with reason and logic. Changing people's lives. When it comes to God, no matter how clever their insights are, no matter how much their logic and reason to understand God, God is only known for who he is through one source. That is through his word. Another problem with logic and reason, it can never eliminate sin, which will always be a barrier to knowing God. And there's a final misrepresentation that we have. It's what I call awareness power. And this is a reference that's happening more and more today is to what a person experiences or what a person feels, that then becomes their authority. It becomes their authority. There are people who say the Bible is their authority, but their personal experience and what they feel trumps anything that the Bible has to say because of what they know and have experienced in their own lives. In other words, if I believe that God has spoken to me, that triumphs anything that the Bible has to say. If I receive a vision, that triumphs or trumps anything that the Bible has to say. In other words, my vision, my personal experience is greater than what the Bible is. And this is what this awareness of it's my personal experiences they become my authority because I feel that this is right I feel that um, it's true a person says I know something is true because I feel it's true 
the harsh reality is feeling isn't knowing. Feelings change. They come and go. They're not consistent. Feeling is not authority when it comes to knowing someone. I can feel attracted to someone. I can feel hatred. I can feel animosity towards someone. But that does not make me an authority because I feel these things towards them and say, I know that person simply because I have this feeling about them. I've never met them before, but you know, I got this sense, hey, there's something wrong with that bloke or that woman. There's just something wrong. And you know, my gut feeling says, don't have anything to do with them. Stay away from them. That's my authority. That's, that's what our feelings go on. Paul's point is that all things mentioned do not give him any authority. The only authority for him comes from the word of God, which he speaks and proclaims when he said, this is what God says. So there's a lot of misconceptions or misrepresentation about authority. It's not the church. It's not a person's absolute power. It's not their experiences. And it's certainly not our academic um, education things that have the power when it comes to determining what the Bible says. The Bible is able to interpret itself. It's very clear on what God has to say. That is our authority. And the confirmation is this. That confirmation. Titus, says Paul, the role of a preacher, preach the word. God has given it to you, so proclaim its truth. The word of God speaks for itself. So if the word of God speaks for itself, you allow God to speak through you as you proclaim that message that he wants people to hear. Now you're doing that tonight. I'm not speaking my opinions. I'm not speaking uh, there to impress you. I'm speaking the word that God has given me. I am going through this verse explaining what it means. And so when the word of God is preached, what it means is, God is present. And when he's present, it enables him to change lives through its preaching because God brings a person under conviction. You know, you've sat in a room and it's as though God has pointed the finger at you and said, you, I'm speaking to you, listen up. And you get that feeling, yes, out of the whole room, this message is for me. I better pay attention. God's got my attention. It's not the preacher, it's what God has to say from his word. Our many people in our modern world don't want to hear what God has to say. They would rather a watered down version that makes them feel good about themselves, something that's not going to offend them, something that's not going to challenge them to change. And many preachers fall into the trap of giving people what they want to hear instead of what they need. In modern day culture, it's rejecting and cancelling out any and every authority that's not in line with their own authority. As a result, there is confusion and chaos. We have people running amok doing their own thing without any fear of punishment or consequences. People are rebelling against authority across all spheres of our society, not just one or two, but against the whole idea of authority. And people are being act impacted. If you live in Alice Springs, go and ask them what they think about it and ask them what they think the authorities are doing about it and ask those who are perpetrating what they think about authorities trying to stop them. We have a big problem and people are demanding this and that and opposing anyone who resists them and it doesn't matter which authority they reject, any legitimacy except their own. Now this then brings forward, oops, conflict. Now most of us don't like conflict. How as a society have we reached this position? What reasons can there be for such rebellion? Why do people want to do their own thing? Why don't they like to be told what to do? And there are some observations that an old time commentator made which I'll summarize very quickly and he comes up with these ideas. The first is no aspect. They have no aspect of what sin is. 
And sin, in its simplest form, is rebellion and hatred of any authority, especially the authority that mankind will be held accountable to God for their actions. Naturally, as people, we have a problem with being told what to do. And so that brings us into conflict where we will not accept any authority but our own. Now we know that people today, there's no respect for God's authorities and laws, no respect for authority of mankind and their accountability. Mankind will not have a bar of it and fights against every opportunity he gets. So he's got no aspect of what sin is. The second thing he mentions is no absolutes. Now what's an absolute? If I say to you there's no such thing as absolute truth, would you agree or disagree? Is there such a thing as absolute truth? Is there such a thing as absolute day and absolute night? Or are there varying shades of grey? You see people say, hey, it, it's only how you look at things. It's relational. How I look at things, that's all that matters. What you consider as absolute truth is not absolute truth to me. I see things differently, but my truth is no different from your truth and should be equally looked at. But you can't be sure that you're absolutely right and I'm absolutely wrong. And that's what they're saying. You can't be sure. And our world is confused about absolute. Even to the point, is there such a thing as an absolute woman and an absolute man? If we believe what our authorities say, no, you can't. You can be whatever you want. Yet the Bible says there is a man, there is a woman. They have functions. They have responsibilities. These are absolute because God as the creator has given them to us. Then we have another contribution, no accountability. And in this, in our modern society, it's a failure of parents to discipline their children, resulting in entire generations of young people who have grown up with no respect for authority and failure to respond to what is done in the right way. In other words, we have parents through the generations who have abrogated their responsibility to their family, pursued their own interest at the expense of raising their children. And when they do discipline, it's with minimal expense, often giving in to the children's behavior to avoid confrontation and conflict in the home. Now, I have seen this regularly in the supermarket. You know, when a child goes through the lolly section, what does it want? You know, two-year-old, three-year-old, what does it want? Where does it go? It goes and it wants a chocolate. And you know, nothing is gonna budge them from getting a chocolate. So how do you deal with a child that wants a chocolate? What do you say? And if you say that magic word, no, you're not gonna have it, what then does a child proceed to do? It chucks a wobbly. It jumps and screams and carries all over the place. Well, you know, when I did that as a toddler, my grandmother whacked the living daylights out of me and said, you're not getting it. Well, I soon learnt that I could make chuck a wobbly for the, as much as I like, but I wasn't getting that. But today, you can't do that. You can't whack your children. You're not allowed. But you know, just to make a point, oh, I don't want um, people to think ill of me and I don't want a, a, an event, so I'll shut that child up and I'll give them what they want. What message does that send to the, the child? If you muck up and you scream loud enough and long enough, 
you get what you want. And it works just about every time. Today we have a generation of angry young people who are determined to have their own way and get what they want and no matter what the cost may be. Children have worked out how to get what they want without any consequences and without being held accountable for their actions. There is also what I call a non-acceptance. Another contributor in our modern day is the role of the social media platforms. They seek to undermine and destroy any form of authority through half-truths and innuendos that are designed to cause doubt, confusion and suspicion of any authority, be it government or civil, in any way. In other words, they'll take a half-truth and promote it as being the whole truth and get people to believe it because they've seen it on TV, they've read it in the newspaper, they've heard it on the radio, so it must be true. And they become an authority. They become a judge and jury and executioner in the public opinion place. A person is judged today not on whether it's right or wrong, it's judged on public opinion that is fueled by social media platforms rather than being found guilty in a court of law. And this is the non-acceptance because what happens is social media platforms then become the heroes to the public who find loopholes in the law to promote their opinion regardless of any damage that they may do regarding the truth and how it affects people. And we've seen that in the media today, how it's been found wrong when a person's been taken to court, when the evidence has been presented, that person has been found not guilty. But you know what? Social media has already judged them. And as a result, people believe what they've read and seen before that person even went to trial. And so we have a non-acceptance. There is another thing I call no awareness. Another contributor in this rebellion against authority is the failure in our society to provide leaders of integrity and character. In other words, having people that are examples of worth following. In other words, a person who practices what they preach. Today, more than ever, we need strong leadership where there's integrity, where people will stand up for the truth and live it out in their lives. Where are all the strong leaders who live what they believe? Where have they gone? Today we've got people that are switching and bending to whatever fad is going on. There's not a strong leader saying, no, this is rubbish. We're not accepting this and we're not going to have a bar of it. It's not there anymore. And then we have the last one, no alternatives. It's a major contributor to the way we think and the way we behave. It's a promotion of entitlement. It's a promotion of our personal rights. It's labelled as humanism, which is being openly embraced by our society where we have all equal rights and entitlements. Yet, as I read the Bible, God did create all human beings, but not every human being is equal. Some people have higher IQs than others. Some people are more skillful in doing certain things than others. Some people are more physical than others. Some people are more social than others. Some people, all people, are different, but not all people are equal. Yet our culture is telling us that all people are the same. There's nothing you cannot do. Well. You know, there's lots of things I cannot do. I want to do them, but I can't do them. And I don't have the opportunity to do them. While many people believe we're equal, the reality is anything but. As one commentator observed, some people go to heaven, others go to hell. Some people belong to God, others don't. Some people are blessed with riches, others are not. So the Bible makes it clear that not all men are equal. It is God who determines what a man will be. And this may include basic human rights and privileges, 
but not every human being is entitled to all the same things. This is a major contributor in our breakdown of our authority today. Humanism has much to say that every human being has a right to the same things, every person has a right to his own opinion. Humanism promotes and replaces God by putting man on the throne and in control of his own destiny with the ability to determine and chart his own course. Well, the Bible says that's not true, but our society says otherwise. And finally, as we finish, the commitment. Say these things and encourage the people. Tell them what is wrong in their lives with all authority. Paul says, after speaking the good news with authority, you exhort people, meaning encourage them in the truth of these things. Bring them to the point of conviction of the word of God so that they themselves will obey it. Then he says, reprove or present the truth of the word with all authority that God has given you, compelling people to do the right thing, not because the preacher says so, but because God says to do it. It's correcting wrong thinking. It's correcting wrong attitudes by using the word of God as the standard by which God wants people to live. This is the authority that every preacher has. Not every preacher does it. But they're to reveal the whole counsel of God of what God wants people to know and how to live according to the standards that he has set. So we have a big issue with authority. Why should I do what I do? Who tells me what to do? For the Christian, it's very easy. God says, this is how I want you to live. Man says, you don't have to live like that at all. No one has the right to tell you what to do. Which way, which authority are you going to believe? Because it's an issue. And we see how it's affecting our society. As Christians, we have one authority. What saith the word of God? Am I going to do it?